Welcome one, welcome all. Uh, honorable members of City Council, in accordance with Virginia Beach Code 2-21 and by the authority vested in me as mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, I hereby call for a special session of the Virginia Beach City Council. Tuesday, August 13th, 2020, 3 p.m., Virginia Beach Convention Center, 1019th Street. The purpose of this special section, session is to allow City Council to convene in a closed session at, from 3, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. At the conclusion of the closed session, City Council will reconvene and certify the closed session and then proceed with regularly scheduled City Council and City Manager briefings, liaison reports, City Council comments, and agenda review at the Virginia Beach Conference Center. Bobby Dyer. Okay, at this point, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from the open meeting allowed by section 2.23711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes. Legal matters, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to the actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. Donald Benton versus City of Virginia Beach and William Bauer. Personnel matters, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of a specific officer's appointees or em employees or appointees of the public body pursuant to section 2.237A7, council appointments, city, uh, city boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. A okay, motion and a second, Madam Clerk. I'm sorry, may, who made the original motion? I can't see. I did. Would. Thank you, Abbott. Councilmember Abbott? Aye. Councilmember Bellucci? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Councilmember Jones? Can you please push your mic, your microphone to turn on, Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Moss? Aye. Mr. Rouse? Aye. Sorry, Councilmember Tower? Aye. Councilmember Wilson? Aye. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. Vice Mayor Wood? Aye. Mayor Dyer? Aye. Okay, at this point, we're going to recess upstairs into executive session. convene in the informal session and a remind, reminder to the council folks and anybody that, uh, that speaks make sure you put on the button get the green light and shut it off when you're finished speaking to avoid the feedback okay mr. manager I believe we're ready for the briefings I'm sorry mayor can you certify the closed session please oh okay my apologies okay could I have a motion to certify the closed session so, so moved. moved second Okay, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Abbott. Councilmember. Councilmember Abbott. Aye. Thank you. Councilmember Berlucci. Aye. Councilmember Henley. Aye. Councilmember Jones. Aye. Councilmember Moss. Aye. Councilmember Rouse. Aye. Councilmember Tower. Aye. Councilmember Wilson. Aye. Councilmember Wooten. Aye. Vice Mayor Wood. Aye. Mayor Dyer? Aye. By a vote of 11 to 0, you've certified the closed session to be in accordance with the motion to recess. Okay, thank you all. Okay, now, Mr. Manager, I think we're about ready. All right, Mr. Mayor, the first item is a city council briefing that was requested by a couple council members. It's going to be the Resort Advisory Committee coming to give an update and a presentation of some recommendations for the resort area. So at this time, I think B.J. Bauman is going to come up to speak and present. Welcome, BJ. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Thank you, Council. Um, 
if you guys wanted to turn up the intimidation factor a little more. <laughs> this, is a, this is a tough size to work with. I had um, prepared myself for you being in a mu much smaller venue there. Um, we do have a presentation from RAC today, and uh, a lot of you we have already had conversations with, so you certainly are aware of uh, most of what is going to be presented. Um, I do want to say that I'm going to take you on a little bit of a walk down the history of Virginia Beach because I think it plays into what we need to do today. Virginia Beach is a young town. It was started as a cottage community, all part of Norfolk, and we have been a vacation destination since our very inception. Um, good, clean, fun. It's always been known as a family-friendly beach. So, we often forget that one of the main reasons, or the main reasons, that people visit Virginia Beach is because of our beach. So, when we get tied up in all of the nuances that go on, we have to remember that the number one priority for us to always remain focused on is the fact that we have to have a great beach. The second priority is that we have to maintain a beautiful boardwalk. It has to be cleaned, it has to be well maintained, and it has to be safe. The third, which is where the majority of, well, the third, which is where the majority of the discussion currently is going to take place, is our front door, Atlantic Avenue, the heart of Virginia Beach. So if you take all of these priorities, which are um, central to what we're trying to do here, we focused on our beach. And if you remember, we instituted Operation Big Beach. I'll never forget that right after that, I had somebody actually complain to me one time that the beach was too wide. Um, but it was a very successful renourishment program and established us as one of the great beaches on the East Coast. The boardwalk, we had a great boardwalk, but we made it even better. When we went through the boardwalk revitalization, we widened the boardwalk, we put out cafe permits, we increased the green belt, <clears throat> and at that point we had a designated resort office to manage all of this. <clears throat> this is part of the result of that revitalization. Business owners that bumped up to the boardwalk and the green belt increase their landscaping. And this is an example of what one of the businesses did here and the people that are enjoying that. Atlantic Avenue, when we, we focused on revitalizing that area, the focus was on the underground utilities. There was um, widened sidewalks that were put in, the buried utilities. Um, we made places so that we could have an entertainment program. And we ended up with a great looking Atlantic Avenue, much more streamlined. We have to take that Atlantic Avenue to the next step now. We provided little pockets of entertainment throughout the beach, which played very well with our family oriented business here. Revitalization and investment, it pays off. We now have an absolutely spectacular boardwalk. We have a wonderful, wonderful beach, and we need to build on that. We've even got our very own icon now with King Neptune. We've been named in the top 10 best boardwalks in America. Our parks have been filled with locals and visitors. From a number standpoint, it paid off. I'm always amazed when I look at this chart because if you look at 9-11, which was a catastrophic event in anyone's eyes, we held our own. It started growing. Then we went through the Great Recession. Again, we flatlined, but then we started growing again. 
Over the past few years, it hasn't been so positive. And a lot of that is due to the neglect and the condition that we see at the resort area now. We, and when I say we, I am including all of us. That's the industry, that's the public segment. Somehow, we've lost pride in our resort area. Our own residents don't have a sense of pride about their beach. We've reduced city services. Our zoning enforcement is almost non-existent. We are unable to maintain pedestrian flow on the sidewalks, and I'm gonna show you pictures of this. Our parks were once filled with residents and guests. Today, they're empty, and this is not just about COVID. This is over several years. Families used to enjoy Atlantic Avenue each evening for the entertainment in its myriad of fashions. Somehow, these programs became a low priority, and they're underfunded, even though we have the TIP fund. Over the past years, <clears throat> the resort district has largely been neglected. And I know I've had the pleasure of walking Atlantic Avenue with several of you, and you've seen it firsthand with me. Reduced cleaning, constant behavioral issues, they're all detrimental to business. Insufficient city services. Our past resort programs office, and you're going to hear a lot about this in upcoming discussions. Um, we had at one point in time, and there are not very many of you that are old enough to remember this, but we had a resort programs office, and it had a resort manager, a <clears throat> dedicated zoning administrator, someone from budgeting, and they were fully staffed to handle the day-to-day -day operations of what goes on at our beach. Lack of attention, deferred maintenance, business neglect, no zoning enforcement, and very little resort advocacy. I've had people accuse me of pulling pictures that only showed the worst. Well, a week and a half ago, I was right at that alley, and it looked virtually the same. Zoning enforcement, illegal signs on each block, and we need to strengthen our sign ordinances. Merchandising is pushed out onto public property, which impedes traffic on the sidewalks. And there's profanity on the sidewalk and on merchandise. And I don't know whether you can see this well or not, but, well, and I'm not even sure that I can say it, but there is profanity on one of those individuals' bottoms that really does not have a place on Atlantic Avenue. And somehow, we have to get our hands around how that can change. While we were asleep at the wheel, and again, I say we, we all have responsibility, the problems grew. But these are not new issues at the beach. Because we weren't involved, a lot of our past issues that we had dealt with have crept forward and are back in our resort area. The homeless have come back in full force, and I've always been dismayed at this, especially since we've got this absolutely phenomenal facility on Witch Duck, but I also understand that it filled up pretty quickly. Um, but we have the homeless back that are making themselves uh, I guess in the homeless world, nice, comfortable pads. Gun violence. We continually have gunshots, wounds, and not only is it happening on Atlantic and Pacific Avenue, it's happening in our neighborhoods. This is what our employees come to work and see. Now, you can imagine the warm and fuzzy feeling they get when they walk up to work and they see a bullet shot that has gone through the window. Families must navigate through very intimidating crowds. We have groups harassing families and selling merchandise out on the sidewalk. 
employee is, has been beaten, and this was in July of this year. And one of the pi most telling pictures I've removed, it was this young lady's face, and we didn't want to show it in, um, in the public environment and on TV. But the wounds that you see here are very small in comparison into what she had done to her face. about to see. I know that some of you have seen it and you're not going to need to. We're good. And Mr. Stiles, I hope you're happy with me. Um, we're going to skip over that. But that video, I just want to call attention to the fact that it is actually what our police force is subjected to every single day at the beach. And I will be glad to show any of you this video in private so that you can see this, but I can tell you, you would be appalled. Um, I can only say that I am truly amazed and truly grateful for what our police force has to endure and that they, fa in fact, they take care of everything that we need for them to. Um, then you have the business side of the house. A lot of the businesses that I've talked to have been at the resort area for many, many years. A lot of them are family operations. And this is the stuff that I'm hearing. It's not safe. My employees are afraid to come to work. There used to be families here. They're gone. My city used to care. They've given up. I cannot build a business in this environment. Behavioral issues are getting worse, and the one that distresses me most of all is I give up. In the past, finding store space on Atlantic Avenue was impossible. Today, you're going to see multiple for lease signs, and I'm really concerned to see what's going to happen this fall, this winter, as a result of COVID on top of all of these issues. For lease, for rent, for sale. The behavioral environmental problems are not new to Virginia Beach. We've dealt with these. We've had them before. We fixed them. We've got to do it again now. And again, I say we because it is we collectively. You as city council, we as individual business owners and associations, are all of the benefits that the citizens of Virginia Beach have enjoyed because of the tax revenues are going to be gone. to the tune of $34 million, and that's just through July of this year, which are very depleted numbers. Whoops. Our goals, our priorities of the past must remain our priorities of today. Unequivocally, we have to have a safe and welcoming, diverse family environment maintain the best, the cleanest, the widest beach possible, a clean, well-maintained boardwalk, a welcoming, safe, and vibrant, family-friendly atmosphere. And then we've got to work on expanding our season. And we have invested in a huge amount of money in a convention center, in an aquarium, in a sports center, that's all built on the foundation of a clean, safe, family-friendly resort. In summary, you have a resolution in front of you that RAC would respectfully request that you support. We would respectfully ask you to direct our wonderful new city manager <laughs> to immediately reinstitute the resort program's office and locate, in, locate it in the resort area. It needs to be on Atlantic Avenue. 
um, and to hire a resort manager to refine and implement the RAC resolution and the RACEAP plan, including, including a finance plan. On an immediate basis, we'd like to see develop and implement an action plan for the 2021 season. If businesses are lucky enough to make it through this fall and winter, I guarantee you they're going to need a season like any other season in the world in order to be able to bring their businesses back to life. So we need to start thinking proactively about what we can do now that's going to ensure a strong 2021 season. That includes safety and law enforcement cleanliness and resort maintenance, restoring and adequately funding a family-friendly entertainment program. One of the things that I have been most struck by, and I know that you have the majority of these letters, there have been some that have um, we've received since your packages were sent to you on Friday, but I'd <clears throat> like for you to take a minute and really look at the people that have sent this in, because this is not just about Atlantic Avenue. This is not just about the businesses. More importantly, it's about our neighborhoods. It's about our residents that live down here. And you will see here civic leagues, condo associations, all of the trade associations, Neptune Festival, Patriotic Festival, the Vibe District. It is an unbelievably comprehensive list of anybody and anything. Even Tidewater Builders Association recognizes the importance over what we're doing. So I hope that um, I have felt really positive about the community support part of this, and I certainly hope that you will. There are a lot of details that are in the resolution. There are a lot of details that still have to be worked out. Um, we have mechanisms in place, and we have, within RAC, already started working proactively on some of those. Um, but I really appreciate you you're hearing our plight at this point, and we'll be glad to answer any questions. Okay, any questions for BJ? And don't forget to put your green light on. Anybody? God, Mr. Tower. I, I would just like to thank uh, Ms. Bauman and all of the members of RAC and all of the other organizations that uh, members of RAC have, have put together for this effort. I, um, I've lived in Virginia Beach for 40 years, but I have been coming to Virginia Beach, I hate to say it, for 70 years. <laughs> and I have seen uh, high points and low points at the beach, as you would in any community, even resort communities go through periodic uh, times where you can't keep everything uh, the way you want it all the time. And, it, and keeping it a, on a steady pace is a problem because you're always one step behind unless you're moving ahead. And we have done a great job of moving ahead in many respects. But right now what we need is major change and I think we need a lot of people involved in it including the resort area including people from the remainder of the community and I'll just take this opportunity to let council know that I intend to ask city attorney to draft appropriate resolutions and ordinances that would uh, implement these suggestions that the resort advisory commission has made and Ms. Wilson's allowed me to say that she uh, is going to also join in sponsoring that, and we invite any other members of council who would like to be part of that to join in. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Anybody else? Ms. Henley. Thank you. Looking at those pictures from the past and remembering what it was like down there in the 80s before we did the Atlantic Avenue beautification and the sign ordinance and all of those things. Thinking back, I just remember how difficult it was to determine what the folks down there really supported. Kind of seemed that if the 
hotel folks wanted this, the restaurant folks wanted something else, or Atlantic Avenue wanted one way, Pacific. And it was always a little difficult to, to work things out. But when you see all of these people saying the same thing now, it should get everybody's attention. Yes, ma'am. I, I think this is one of the most impressive things I've seen over all these years from the oceanfront. And you're right. If it's not safe, and if it's not clean, and if it's not welcoming and wholesome, we can build hotels all we want, but it's not going to solve anything. Uh, we've really got to work together, and you're right, we've got to start right now. And uh, I, I really appreciate the work that, that you all did to bring this resolution to us. Uh, it's powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moss? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've, I've been talking, as Guy well knows, with Mr. Tower about, based on my own visits, and thank you for coming down here and bringing an issue. Uh, I would expand that stakeholders to all the communities in the heartland of the city as well. Yes, I mean, sir. Everybody has a You're vested right. interest. I was very pleased to, to you acknowledge and called out some of the private businesses, people who aren't doing their part, thought that was great. And there is a need for investment. I think a lot of the stuff that we see here is not COVID related, but it's underlying structural issues that have to be addressed. And I think you would agree. Yes, and sir. I don't think we can be too aggressive. I think there's two priorities in our community. One is flood mitigation, which we need at the ocean front too, I might add. <laughs> and uh, making sure that the ocean front maintains a vital business. And uh, hopefully this extra supplement of COVID funding that we received might be able to help us uh, help the businesses along and, and make it to next spring. But thank you for coming down. Thank, thank you, Mr. Tower, for all your advice you've given me over the last couple of weeks. I do appreciate it. And I will be co-sponsoring your stuff as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wood. And I, I agree with what's been said. I, I guess the only question I have, Guy, is just procedural. You said, so is this resolution that they provided not the one that you want to go forward with? Um, and in talking with the city attorney, he, he said that if if uh, we could get take the RAC resolution, they think they can draft uh, draft it into implementation resolutions. Obviously, we'll have to take a look at those. Yeah, because this one's signed by Rod as um, approved as a legal sufficiency. But that's for RAC, RAC's adoption. R RAC is a city appointed board, and it is in. I don't believe that's for city okay. adoption. Am I correct with that, PJ? I mean, we could adopt it as far as I'm concerned, but I'm, I defer to the city attorney. We, we drafted that to assist RAC, but we would draft one specifically for this body. It would be tailored closely after that, but it would be for this body to adopt. Okay. Well, but there wouldn't be any changes or deletions or... We would, we would put that, what the content of that, as I understand the, the request from Mr. Tower, is to put the content of the RAC resolution into a resolution for the city council the, the to The seven adopt. items on there, that is, that's, that's yes. the meat of it, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, that, that's good, thank you. Okay. Ms. Wilson. Thank you, BJ, for coming forward with this and also at the RAC meeting, uh, she had a big, Ovation from the RAC for, for such a job well done. Um, my very first meeting with, as you called him, our wonderful Mr. City Manager, we had lunch, and he asked me the question, What's, what do we need to do right away? What's the most pressing thing we need to do? And my answer to him was, we've got to do something about the oceanfront. The season is halfway go you know, gone. We've got to really get started and, and do a lot of the things to make it a safer, more inviting community and place to be. And so, uh, you know, we were on it, but you put everything together to say, here is a game plan. Right. This is a game plan and of what we can do, and it's, it's, it's a good game plan. And I'm hopeful that, I mean, I know that there's some, a larger big ticket item, but some of the stuff we can start on right away. Yes, you know, ma'am. The, the enforcement of, there shouldn't be vendors out on the sidewalk. You know, uh, we need to find a place for our homeless to sleep. 
not on the sidewalk. Um, we can do cleaning. of the Because when I walked with you, it was just the sidewalks were filthy. Was that a place you'd want to be? No. Right. And we just we used to do it more often, but let's go ahead and up the game on the on the cleaning. And so the, identify the things that we can do right away. Right. And let's get started. The time is now. Um, I think we've got a, a good game plan, and I really believe you've got the citizens and a lot of the associations and everyone behind you. And boy, if we all get together and roll up our sleeves, we can do anything we want. So thank you for doing this, and uh, it's just a real pleasure having you here today. And Mayor Dyer, I might add that RAC is locked and loaded. We're ready to run on this. Um, a lot of the things are low-hanging fruit, and um, we'll be glad to work with any of the city staff that you direct towards us um, and in accomplishing this. And we do have much bigger projects that this is going to lead to, but we need to do those items like the mobility study so that we are laying the appropriate foundation for how we're proceeding ahead. But thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wooten. I would also just like to express my gratitude to you and RAC and all the key stakeholders who made this possible. Uh, I can tell you when I look at this and I listen to the presentation, this is a demonstration of great leadership. And so um, I certainly would like to be a co-sponsor on this resolution. Uh, just yesterday I was reading an email from a concerned citizen and screaming from the email said, do something, do something, please. And I think this is a huge step in the right direction and um, I concur with several of my colleagues. We certainly need to move forward on this uh, as soon as we can. And I certainly support it. And again, thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Abbott. I apologize. My glasses keep getting stuck on this mask. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I really appreciate the one-on-one -on -one time I got to spend down at the oceanfront walking, walking around. And uh, I, I, sadly, I don't get down there enough. Um, I, I, Mr. Tower, I'm, I would like to be added as well as a co-sponsor. I fully support your initiative, and I think there's a lot of good that will come from doing this. Mm -hmm. I would like to add that um, this council consider the steps we want to take because one of the key points of this presentation was how do we get locals getting that pride back in the ocean front and I think um, in the in the discussion I had with uh, George we talked at length about how we re-engage uh, as Mr. Moss says the heartland of the city and bringing the locals back to the ocean front because I think if we have locals that are ambassadors of our beach we will have that that uh, that spark that sustains those small businesses throughout, you know, the the low season, so to speak, or the the, the slow season, so to speak, um, and that they'll want to bring their families down and and say, hey, I've got family in town, right. and we want to come down and spend time at the oceanfront. I mentioned to Laura that I went down there on a whim this weekend and ate at a restaurant that I didn't know was there, and it was a great experience. So I I think that there is. Um, I think that a lot of people, the further west you get in the city, they start to feel left out, and we do really have to have a plan moving forward on how we re-engage them and bring that love back. Because I, I remember growing up and saying, I'm going to go down the Jewish Mother, and we're going to see a live show and a local band. And right. it was a great experience. And I think that we need that heartbeat back. And so I'm eager to, to, to work in whatever capacity you'll have me and help with that, because I, I think that there is a real bright path forward with right. taking back the oceanfront for the locals so that they're ambassadors for our visitors. We couldn't agree more. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? I just want to say thank you for your dedication, and there are so many people at the oceanfront that do so many great things. I think uh, COVID has really impacted not only, you know, oceanfront, the city, this commonwealth and this nation. But that being said, I think we found out a very true value of our oceanfront. And, you know, once again, it's 
financial, it's a revenue generator, and your, when your businesses are hurt, our city is hurt. And let me say this, as part of the recovery, and the number of times I've been out there, when I see people from all over the city coming and walking on the boardwalk and the beach, it's healthy. It was helping get over you know, the confinement and everything that we had. But that was one part of it. You know, obviously, we, I think we have to act, and I, I'm willing to you know, co-sponsor this also, but we have to act to have you ready for next year. I think that's of paramount import, importance. Elsewise, we may be losing some other businesses you know, going forward. But to say that the value of this, but you know, once again, the deterioration of it, it you know, is a separate issue that I think we really have to uh, address. Yes, sir. And the other thing is, as we look you know, with the opening of the sports center, and we look for a more year-round destination, and we find more people moving down there year-round, as we transition to a year-round destination, it is extremely important that we get our beach going. And as uh, Councilwoman Abbott said, you know, let's get people from all over the city to come back to their beach and make that the welcoming beach and everything that we want. Right. Virginia Beach is our beach. So right. thank you all very much. I really appreciate the presentation thank and you. we will take this as a very high priority. I'm sure council agrees. Does this mean that it will be up next week? Yeah, Guy, I think we could be ready next week. All right. I, so I, certainly, uh, I certainly hope we'll have it on the agenda for a public hearing. Uh, in, in terms of a vote, I leave that to the will of council. I'd be happy to have a, I know the folks in the REC would like to get a vote as soon as they can. Okay, we'll get things expedited. Okay. So maybe yeah. public hearing the next time and then the vote. Yeah, yeah, but That's you know, awesome. we're, we're gonna move on this rapidly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Okay, Mr. Dehaney, we're on for the next one. All right, Mr. Mayor, Member of Councils, before we get into the, the presentation regarding the Lynn Haven River Basin Project, there are a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. First item is uh, today we're going to, um, Councils, getting ready to move on providing hazard pay to our first responders, which is um, an incredible show of gratitude for all the work that they have done. We've talked also about possibly preparing some kind of proposal that we can do for the rest of the workforce for your attention and also include this in the Friday package is just a draft recommendation, a proposal of what we can possibly do in terms of offering our, our non first responder employees who don't qualify for the CARES Act money, a possible um, expression of our gratitude for the work that they provided. You know, it's, um, it's nothing that'll be taken up today. You know, something that we hope to introduce probably around the first part of September. So we just wanted to give you a heads up of what that is because I know a lot of you all like myself are getting a lot of questions and concerns from our employees who aren't covered under CARES Act about is something gonna be done for them. So we just wanted to give you with something that you can use as some talking points. Um, first, the next item I wanna talk about is the Westminster Canterbury Project. Um, we received a letter from the applicant asking to be taken off the agenda for August 25th and to possibly be considered for a September 22nd special council session to discuss that project and it's council's discretion if that is to happen and occur. So I've provided a letter in the Friday package and I just wanna get some feedback from council as it, to, as it relates to where they are on possibly granting the applicant an ability to move to September 22nd. Is there any problem with moving that item to the 20, uh, 22nd? Yeah, Mr. Rouse. I don't have a problem with moving an item. I would like to have a, a brief comment on the first item with hazard pay. So um, the first items you brought up about hazard pay for our city employees. Um, and I think it's really important. I know this year COVID presented us some, some really um, unique challenges in the way we, we were supposed to, employees supposed to get a pay increase this year. Um, but we decided we'll look at that after we, we look at the numbers and how our city fared economically wise. Um, I think this is a great gesture um, to really let our employees know that we, we, I know I consider all of them essential and that the work that they provide for our city, um, our city would not function without them. 
And I go for all the men and women, um, whether you're in the, the garage or you're out, you know, cutting grass, the lawns, or you're just, you know, making sure our visitors bureau is functioning or city hall is functioning. Um, I really value the, the work that our staff um, is continuously doing in all the offices and, and departments. Also, uh, you know, I really, really um, think this is a strong step towards building that unity to making sure our employees know that we really do care about them. I know the, in the CARES Act, it's specifically, um, specifically supposed to go to those uh, first responders, um, which is incredibly important, the work they do for, for our city, and they have our support um, as well. And I also think there, there's some employees who fall in that, that no man's land, so to speak, um, specifically talking about the um, uh, precinct desk officers who aren't yet, who aren't sworn um, employees, but yet they are Alpha One love employees. And as the letter I sent to council, they, they interact every day and they serve a great function to our police departments and making sure that um, our officers can, can do their job uh, with the best of their ability as well. Uh, and so I, I surely hope they are included. If they're not included in, in, the, in the hazard pay this for the CARES Act, they are definitely um, included in the, what we're gonna do, um, your recommendations. Hopefully we, we follow your recommendations. So I just wanna, you know, if you can just clarify that those uh, potential employees who aren't um, you know, be, be able to, to, to take part of the, the hazard pay, that, they, that this will, that will be covered under this recommendation. This recommendation is to cover those employees, in particular our um, first line employees that worked in public utilities and also um, public works. And also, I think it covers as well the police district, police precinct desk um, staff as well. You know, I think it's to offer a thousand for the first line employees and also a $250 thank you pay for the remaining employees. It will not cover employees that make over $100,000. And also it's expected to be used, the funding sources, possibly the savings for um, the savings we've saw from the hiring freeze as well. Thank you, Mr. DeHaney. And, and lastly, I just wanna express my sincere gratitude for our staff and our employees um, for all the work they do to keep Virginia Beach going, um, as well as for our first responders who are out there on the front lines every day. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Ms. Henley. I, I guess it's my hearing or something, even though the ear doctor says I don't have a problem with my ears. Something about the acoustics in this room and this setup, I just have the hardest time following. And I, I was looking at the agenda and I expected Lynn Haven River Basin, but I think we got to another topic. What did we do? Jump over to the, has, the hazardous pay issue? I, I sort of got lost there. Mm -hmm. Oh, Ms. Henley, I was just giving you a heads up on the letter that I provided for you all to consider. It's nothing to act on right now, but just since we're taking up the hazard pay today, we've all been getting a lot of questions about is there gonna be something for the remaining employee workforce? So I just provided you a letter about a possible proposal that we're gonna to try to get on the agenda in September. So you can have a talking point as it relates to is there gonna be something possible for other employees? Okay. Yeah, it was, it was, Ms. Henley, it was just a point of discussion for clarification for, you know, further action. I just want to respond to your specific request about the, the special session and agenda for Westminster Canterbury, which I have no objection to. I would only hope that we could look at, if we are still behind, that other stuff that would get us up to speed so that we could return to regular order of business in October would be great and reestablish our battle rhythm. So if we're gonna have a out of cycle meeting with Westminster, I understand that'd be a big crowd, but still I'd like to, if we can, if the mayor, I defer to you and the vice mayor to look at what other else we could possibly get on the agenda so that if we could, we could return to normal order of business in October would be great. You know, I concur, Mr. Moss. I think we all wanna get back to the normal order. Uh, we did have to, we were almost, compelled to have a couple special sessions along the way. Uh, hopefully they were well articulated, but I think uh, movement of the Westminster Canterbury, you know, given the significance of it and the magnitude of it, uh, you know, deserves, you know, it, you know, yeah, I think the move, does anybody object to the move, uh, you know, to the next date? 
Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Stiles. Just, just for the public and for uh, clarification, Mr. Mayor, um, given that there is no objection to removing the item that is currently scheduled for the, the Westminster item, which is currently scheduled on your agenda and advertised for August the 25th, that item will be on for a vote next week, and that vote would be for a deferral to a special meeting on um, September 22nd, which would be a special meeting. For the public who may not have seen the letter in the package, there are 27 other items on your agenda for next week. This would have been the 28th. Uh, I, I reached out to representatives of the community to let them know uh, the possibility, and they both indicated, or the people that I spoke to at least indicated that they would, would while they want to have it over with, they, uh, th they would rather not be the 28th of 28 items. So there will still be an agenda item on next week. If someone signs up to speak, because it is on your agenda, you will have to allow them to speak, but we would notify all persons when they call to speak that council has indicated its intention to defer and, and the intended deferral date so that perhaps those people would not um, uh, feel compelled to come out and address you next week. I just wanted to clarify that there would still be on the agenda, there would still be a vote, but you have indicated, I think, unanimously of those of you who are participating, the intent to defer it. So, so staff will be communicating that to citizens over the next week. Yeah, I think that's the fairest way that we can handle it, you know, at this point. So, but, you know, thank everybody for their attention and, you know, working this out. Really appreciate it. Okay. And at this time, I'll ask Ms. Susan Layton from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. She's the Chief of Planning and Policy to come do a presentation. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Susan Layton. No, I'm not Susan Layton. I'm <laughs> Phil Pullen. Uh, I was going to say a few words before uh, we bring up Ms. Layton from the Corps. Good afternoon, Mayor and, and Council Members. Uh, let's see, are we on the right slide? Yes. Today we're going to talk about the Lynn Haven River uh, Basin Ecosystem Restoration Project that we were asked to come back and, and do a brief presentation on. Um, this project is all about improving water quality in the Lynn Haven River. This project is a culmination of approximately 15 years of planning and design that have, um, under, have been undergoing by the Corps and the city through a, a cost participation. Uh, the project consists of multiple phases, as you see here, uh, sub submerged aquatic vegetation, uh, wetland restoration, and, and reef, the, the reef that we're going to talk about today. Um, this project is integral in achieving goals set forth in the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement. Um, the project, again, is being administered by the Corps, cost participation with local sponsor, the city, uh, and we have also been coordinating with Lynn Haven River now. Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and many other environmental organizations over the last 15 years. There's been an extensive uh, public involvement effort with this project, that we, and we believe we have satisfied the citizens' concerns. And a few key, if I can, let's see, how do I advance that? There you go. A few key uh, milestones shown on this chart that I just wanted to point out that shows city council's approvals and support over the last 15 years. You can see in 2003, Council established the original project. In 2004, Council uh, approved an ordinance for the study through a, a cost participation agreement with the Corps. In 2015, Council approved a, an ordinance for the design. Again, uh, an agreement to uh, move the design forward. In 2016, Council approved an ordinance for the Oyster Lease uh, acquisition. And then in 2018, most recently, Council approved an ordinance for the construction of the project. Um, now I will turn it over to Susan Layton, who is the Chief of Planning and Policy for the Corps, and she will give you a more detailed presentation and we will answer any questions that you may have. Welcome. Here you go, Susan, right there. Right, right button. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks, Phil, for the introduction. So good evening. My name is Susan Layton. I am Chief of Planning for the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And on behalf of Colonel Kinsman and our Norfolk District team, 
I very much appreciate the opportunity to come today to discuss our Lynn Haven ecosystem restoration project. I personally started working on this project in 2011 and have worked on it for now almost 10 years. So as a career planner, I'm always delighted to see a project that actually gets to construction um, because not everything does. Our Norfolk District team has worked over 15 years on this project with our restoration partners in the Lynn Haven River. And we were excited when Congress chose this project as the only ecosystem restoration project nationwide to be funded in fiscal year 18. We're also very thankful to have an engaged and supportive partner in the city of Virginia Beach, as well as the rest of our restoration partners in the Lynn Haven. So just a few notes. I know you all are very familiar on why it's important to restore the Lynn Haven River, um, but just a, a, a few notes to emphasize some of the reasons why the federal government also thinks it's an important investment. So this is a tr priority tributary for oyster restoration for the Chesapeake Bay program. Some of the most important recreational areas in Virginia are in the Lynn Haven and is the largest tidal estuary in Virginia. It is home to nursery, foraging grounds, nesting areas, and migratory habitat. And we're also very lucky to have a very engaged restoration community in this area. So the total project cost is approximately 39 million, and approximately 10 million is allocated for the first phase of the project, which it does include hard reef habitat, SAV, and wetland restoration. So we are appreciative of all of our project partners shown up here, including not just the city of Virginia Beach, but the Virginia Beach Public Schools, and I'll in a moment tell you why they're an important part of the project as well, as well as NOAA, VIMS, Lynn Haven River Now, um, who we have a, a very happy to have Ms. Karen Forget here um, as well today, um, supportive of the project, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and the Virginia Marine Resource Commission. So as mentioned, the Lynn Haven Ecosystem Project is approximately a $39 million project, which includes SAV, wetland, and hard reef habitat. It was authorized by Congress in 2013, deeming it a project within the federal interest, and then allocated funds in fiscal year 18. I am going to provide an overview today of the entire project, but I know that we were specifically asked to come provide some additional information on the reef habitat portion. And we will cover that in more detail in some of the slides to, um, to come. The phase one reef, reef area will account for eight of the 31 acres slated for construction on this project. And these 31 acres of reef habitat will account for, um, is a large component of the 45 acres needed to call the Lynn Haven tributary a restored uh, oyster tributary. This slide does show all phases of the Lynn Haven. So the project sites shown up here are not just the phase one sites, but all of the sites that are included within the project. So I know Phil gave out uh, some of the project background and that was a little bit more from the local perspective. We did also want to provide an overview from the, of the federal engagement of the project starting um, almost 15 years ago in 2005 when project planning efforts began. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I did want to highlight a few things. Um, this was approximately a $3 million study. Uh, we received the appropriations in 2018. Since then, we have had several public meetings in 2018 and 2019 to provide understanding, answer questions, and respond to comments that have been provided by members of the public. And I will note there is a one small mistake in the slide. It says under 2018 that in August we held a meeting at the Virginia Beach Municipal Center. We actually held one in August of 2019, so just a slight correction there. Throughout this timeline, in addition to this project being ongoing, there have been multiple reefs, similar restoration type reefs, constructed by the Corps and others in the Lynn Haven. So our current recommendation is consistent with these ongoing restoration efforts, which have already resulted in a cleaner, Lynn Haven with robust recreation and commercial opportunities. I 
think I'm not pointing in the right direction when I hit the, the slide. So the Lynn Haven Phase 1 project is shown here and does include wetlands and submerged aquatic vegetation, including and in addition to the reef habitat that we were asked to come and discuss. Specific to the reef habitat, we did um, want to mention that we understand that um, some additional information was requested based on some comments from concerned citizens. We acknowledge these concerns and always welcome public feedback on our projects. We want to ensure that we minimize, mitigate, and avoid any impacts wherever possible, and I'm going to talk through what those comments have been and why we feel we've done that to the best of our ability. It's very fair and reasonable for members of the public to have concerns with things that are being built right in their area, and particularly things that impact them from a personal perspective of their homes. And many of the projects that we build do deal with these types of projects. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is the largest public engineering organization in the nation, um, we have, as this organization, we welcome this feedback, and we must have this dialogue in order to make our projects better. So the next couple slides, I'm just going to provide a quick overview of the entire project. Um, so as you can see up here, phase one does include submerged aquatic vegetation and fringe reef habitat. Uh, this contract has already been awarded to the Virginia Institute of Marine Science um, through a cooperative service agreement um, with the Corps. Signs and water quality modeling stations have been set up in this area. And we're also very excited that Chesapeake Bay Foundation has been installing Fringe Reef. They already started uh, some of that installation. Um, that Fringe Reef will be on the outside of those SAV areas, and that SAV will be planted in the fall. So the wetland habitat, uh, the wetlands that we, the first phase of wetlands will be located along Thalia Creek at Princess Anne High School. Uh, this, uh, we're in the midst of this contracting action as we speak. And we're hoping for a contract award in September for those wetlands. Finally, the reef habitat is located in the Lynn Haven between Keeling Creek and Dix Creek. Uh, that contract has been awarded, um, but where we are now is due to the appropriate time for reef placement. That reef will not be placed until March of 2021 at the earliest. The window for reach pla reef placement is March 1st to July 31st and that is anticipated during 2021 and 2022. So a little bit more detail about the submerged aquatic vegetation and fringe reef habitat. The SAV will include eelgrass and widgeon grass. This is planted in historic areas via seed collection and then hand broadcast. The first phase is anticipated 6.3 acres of SAV with Fringe Reef near Long Creek adjacent to First Landing State Park. And VIMS is currently in the process of completing the tasks that are listed up on the slide. The Phase 1 Wetland Restoration Site is located at Princess Anne High School at Thalia Creek. This wetland restoration targets 5.46 acres of wetland and riparian habitat at the high school. The multiple benefits of this type of wetland restoration are listed on the slide. And we've really been delighted since the planning feasibility stage to include this partnership with Virginia Beach Public Schools as this will create an outdoor living resources laboratory. So part of the wetland restoration is eradication of Phragmites in the area. This is one of the opportunities uh, that this wetlands restoration uh, project will allow us to treat and remove this Phragmites, which is an invasive species that outcompetes the native vegetation. In addition, we'll also reestablish historic elevations, channels, topography, and native wetland vegetation. As mentioned, this site allows the opportunity for an outdoor living resources laboratory. Um, and this is unique. We don't get an opportunity to do this often throughout the nation. So we're super excited that we can do that right here in Virginia Beach. Students will have the opportunity to actively engage with resources and restoration of the Chesapeake Bay through hands-on learning experience, help with planting, partner with our Corps of Engineers scientists for monitoring evaluation, 
and there will be teacher-led research and evaluation efforts. The students can also participate in the monitoring of the wetland through monitoring of species density, diversity, and percent cover. And course, Corps of Engineers scientists will train teachers in a workshop setting for data collection. So now I'm going to move on to a little bit more information on the reef habitat phase one restoration site. So the site is shown here uh, in the shaded area. And some of the further slides kind of show more detail about exactly where we would be uh, uh, constructing the reef within that area. So we did the design the lease and design the reefs to be a far, as far away from the users, the piers and homes, as well as the navigation channel as possible within the lease. The other factors that we considered within the design are shown on this slide and include the environmental conditions necessary for a successful oyster reef, including appropriate bottom substrate, appropriate hydrodynamics for larval transport and spat retention, and absence of submerged aquatic vegetation. This slide shows the existing reefs in the Lynn Haven River. As you can see, there are multiple existing reefs in the Lynn Haven. What we're proposing is consistent with existing visual, recreational, and commercial landscape in this tributary. We worked very closely with the, with the restoration partners to construct reefs in the past and develop a master plan for restoration of this tributary. As agreed to in the 2014 Chesapeake Bay Agreement by the Commonwealth, the other Chesapeake Bay states, the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers, restoration is an identified and agreed upon goal for a healthier Chesapeake Bay. The Chesapeake Bay program endorsed the goals of restoration of 10 tributaries by 2025, and the Lynn Haven tributary was identified by a larger group of stakeholders in Virginia as one of these tributaries. This project and the reef construction identified will result in approximately 80% of the remaining acreage needed as a Chesapeake Bay community to construct to meet our oyster restoration goal in the Lynn Haven. So some of the items that are of concern that have been identified um, as part of this reef construction and that we have worked to make sure that we are minimizing impacts include navigation needs, public safety needs, and aesthetics. And it's always our top priority to keep the public safe. So we have taken landowner feedback into consideration and designed to minimize impacts to recreation. Uh, one of the things, no other work or construction will be allowed inside this lease. So this reef is uh, proposed for a long-term protected or protectual sanctuary status. Um, so there will not be other um, aquaculture or other uh, things that might occur within the lease. So it will be protected as a perpetual sanctuary. In order to account for safety and ensure that it is um, easy to identify the area, there is signage that is included as part of the project per state agency and US Coast Guard coordination. So that was part of the Coast Guard permit that we have appropriate signage so that it's easy to identify where the reef is located. So we did shift the reef to the deepest depths within the lease area. So in order to uh, allay some of the concerns about the depths, um, I will state that, as you know, there is limited real estate available for restoration within the Lynn Haven. So we are working within the leases that were available and acquired by the city. Within those lease areas, we're minimizing the impacts to the extent practicable. And we did set the reefs apart from channels to the greatest extent practicable as well. So some additional details on the reef design is shown here. One thing to focus on is that picture in the center, the actual size of the reefs are shown next to our restoration partner, Jackie Shannon from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. You can see her standing next to a reef ball. It has an arrow pointing down that says actual size. So as you can see, the reef balls are only 12 inch high. Um, so they're, they're um, very low reef balls. They're round and dome shaped for safety and will be submerged under normal conditions with a low profile design. 
They're made of concrete and placed two feet apart in all directions. So in the lower right, you can see the placement of how the reefs will occur, two feet apart, one feet high. So we did want to note, even though water quality is obviously a, a top priority for every, everyone, there's also other benefits, particularly to this three-dimensional reef design. Um, it, is, it does benefit other fish and invertebrates, not just oysters. So it is habitat for bay critters of all sorts. Um, the use of artificial substrate has been encouraged by the bay-wide bay restoration community. And I will note that Norfolk District has built in partnership um, with the City of Virginia Beach and Virginia Marine Resources Commission in the past, large shell reefs, um, some of those near the mouth of the Lynn Haven. Uh, some of those were destroyed by Hurricane Irene um, when many of the shells were washed away, and then we have to maintain them and rebuild them. Um, so this is one of the multiple reasons why we've moved to using alternative substrate. Uh, we want to make sure that the reefs are there in, for a long time, that they're not, uh, they're not for harvest purposes, they're for restoration purposes, um, and that they're self-sustaining, that we don't need to come back and shell them with additional um, shells, which are considered a limited resource within Virginia. So some of the benefits provided by reef habitat, more than just water quality, um, as I mentioned, a lot of other organisms like to use the reefs, including large fish, which often increases rec recreational opportunities near the reef. So these reefs will be open, open to those other recreational purposes. Uh, we cannot allow oysters to be removed from the reef, but fishing near the reef is allowed and should be improved in those areas. All of the areas around the state where we built oyster reefs, we've seen increased um, fishing recreational usage. So some of the items that we had to consider when building the reef, one, we used a larval transport model developed by VIMS. So we had to make sure that the, the uh, hydrodynamics were appropriate for the larval transport throughout the tributary. Uh, the purpose of the reef is to, um, to populate the river with oysters. So we wanna make sure that we're putting in a reef in an area that can appropriately do so. As I mentioned, the demand for oyster ground leases has changed dramatically since the beginning of the project. So when we began 15 years ago, um, the lease demand in the Lynn Haven was not nearly so high. It's a lot higher now, making the acquiring of leases much more difficult for restoration purposes. So the restoration community, including the Corps of Engineers, is often limited in the areas we can build. We can't just go build anywhere. We can only build where there is a lease acquired or area identified for restoration purposes. So we've, we've noted the public involvement throughout the project. Um, this is a history of the public involvement here. Uh, we did, back in the planning stage, hold several public meetings, including a meeting on the environmental assessment held in 2012, which did include the specific recommendations for the project. In addition, there were several recent public meetings to provide information and respond to concerns on the reef proposals. We mailed certified letters to residents near the project to do to the best of our ability to ensure that anyone that wanted information or had questions knew how to obtain that information and come discuss the project with the project team members. We also recently did meet with a small group of local citizens just a few weeks ago to ensure shared understanding of the most recent concerns. We understand that we cannot always resolve all concerns, but we want to at least try to have a shared understanding to make sure that um, the citizens are being heard and that we are providing the information on the project. So just a little bit more on the collaboration and outreach and involvement. We did go through a full permit coordination with the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, which included a, uh, a joint uh, a joint permit application where a hearing was held for the permit. Um, there were some concerns or protests on the permit, and there was an opportunity, we gave a presentation, an opportunity for any members of the public to have concerns, that had concerns to come voice their concerns. Virginia Marine Resources Commission heard that and still did approve uh, the permit. I will state, um, since it's something that's been brought to our attention by multiple members of the public and it, and it might have come up in your um, conversations uh, with some of the concerned citizens, is there has been a question of incorrect depths in our permit application. 
or a, a um, statement has been made that that's the case, um, those, uh, from the beginning, that was not incorrect depths. It was a datum conversion that had to be made. We originally submitted our permit with NAVD 88, which is a common core of engineers datum used uh, in, in our design drawings, that it was not something that was easily readable on these drawings. We concurred with that. We converted those to mean high water and mean lower low water. Um, so moving forward, obviously those were corrected so everyone knew the appropriate depths, all the agencies that we coordinated with and members of the public. So just wanted to make sure, because I know that's come up in multiple conversations and that was a, a datum conversion that was identified and corrected. So as we move towards the end of the presentation, I did want to provide some visuals on exactly the depths around these reef structures. So this is a pre-construction or what currently um, is on the site. These are the site depths at mean high water. So at the mean high water, the range is anywhere from three and a half to four feet. And you can see some different, it's, it's kind of hard to tell up on the screen. I think you guys have the presentation in your packet, um, but yeah, you can see there, there is a range there, but, but approximately three and a half to four feet. So the pre-construction site depths that mean lower low water are anywhere from one and a half to two and a half feet. So those are shown here. Now on this graphic, the white area within the blue shaded area, the white line is the full lease, but the yellow line is the proposed area of reef construction. So as you can see, we've bumped back as far as we can from the shoreline. Um, from the primary navigation channels. There's not an identified federal channel here, but from the areas that are used. Within the area that we have, we have bumped back as far as we can. So this is post-construction that we're looking at here. So basically after the reefs are installed, these are the water depths over the installed reef at mean low, low water. So obviously there is not going to be a lot of depth over top the reefs at mean low, low water. We anticipate approximately half a feet of water over the reefs at mean low, low water under normal conditions. Now, obviously, you know, tides and water levels change all the time. So there could be, uh, there could be times under extremely low water conditions that the reefs are visible under, under very low water conditions. But what our surveys show us post-construction is that they would still have some water un, um, over them during mean low, low water. So we did want to point out what is the shallowest area on the site because I know there have been concerns about is this a, a safety um, concern and that is why we have put signs out and or why we've proposed to put the signs out. That's part of our permit. So basically if you look within the yellow area which is where the reef would be constructed and you look in that top corner, it's kind of the top left hand corner, there is an area that would have less than half a foot of depth or less post construction. So that is the only area with less than half a foot of, of water above the reef after the project construction is that blue area within the yellow line. So it is a very, you know, a small area in the shallowest um, bit there. So one final visual here is areas of, of 0.1 feet of depth or less. And again, under normal conditions, with mean low, low water conditions, there would be no area of the reef above water uh, under these conditions. There is a larger blue area at the top left. Um, that blue shape is not a part of our project. That's right up, um, along the white line. So we're really just looking at what's within the yellow line. I'm not sure how to bring this back up to the right screen, but uh, to summarize, um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and City of Virginia Beach have jointly invested millions of dollars in the Lynn Haven Ecosystem Restoration Project. We've been planning this project from 2005 into the present. Uh, this is designed to enhance multiple aquatic life, not just oysters, um, but many other organisms in the tributary. Uh, we have looked at this many times, we've heard the concerns, and there has been a robust public participation project for many, many years, or public participation process for many years, including more specifically in the last few years um, with the, the concerns that have been uh, raised. 
Um, and we do feel that we have, um, to the best of our ability, minimized the impacts that would occur. We're excited about this project and uh, its, its contribution to the restoration of the Chesapeake Bay and all of the both restoration and recreational opportunities it'll bring to our um, citizens here locally. So that is the end of my presentation. I welcome any questions or comments, and I thank you for the opportunity to provide the information to you today. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Very insightful. Any questions? Mr. Moss. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I have two questions I want to just confirm. I think you said that there is not any substrate, to use your term, being deposited within the navigation channel. Is that correct? Correct. There's no, there's no federally recognized navigation channel right in that area, but we, the, we looked at where um, future channels might go and where is most often used by um, boaters, and we avoided those areas. Thank you. My second question is, did any of the landowners who raised concerns which you did not address to their satisfaction, did any of those parties within the judicial timeframes allowed under the various regulations you act file suit? No, sir. There was no suits filed. And to my understanding, we did respond to all comments to the best of our ability and do what was within our power to minimize the impacts. Correct. But all standing to sue or file has expired, correct? Uh, people can, anyone can bring suit at any time, but, but, but all of our legal like comment periods and NEPA review periods are concluded, correct? Right, thank and you. all of our permit uh, comment periods. Correct. That's what I was referring to. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much. Most appreciated. Thank you. Okay. At this point, any council liaison reports? Ms. Moss. I have just won the Virginia Beach Development Authority. You may remember they had the Veterans Housing Project, Cypress Gardens in Chesapeake. They have closed and their loan and all that stuff is, so they've taken a major liability that they were working on and not the books. And so now there's a service and income as well. And I've asked them to come forward at some future date when Mike we can come and they can tell you about success, but that is a big step forward in their milestone to improve their financial situation. I wanted just to share that with the body. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Wilson. I just wanted to let everybody know that the Southside Network Authority has awarded a contract for the next 30% of the design for the, for the ring. Uh, this is a very well, highly thought of engineering firm. Um, so there'll be 60% done and they'll have a much, much better handle on on the cost of what that ring is going to be. Uh, the other really uh, good thing about this particular firm, the authority is gonna really need a, an engineer to be on board. So when <clears throat> the ring is built, uh, whoever the contract will be to get that, um, they're gonna have this particular company to be that engineering firm because the network doesn't have that expertise. Uh, they have hired a, an executive director. His name is Steve Dubarry. Uh, he had worked with uh, Norfolk, and he came uh, highly qualified and recommended by someone we all, most of us know, we all remember Catherine Weitzel. So <clears throat> anyway, just wanted to give an advance notice of what's going on. Thank you. Anyone else for liaison? Council comments? Mr. Moss. This is, a, I know we were hoping that we would have had a bond referendum in November with regards to flooding, but COVID and the uncertainty that all created, that kind of rightfully so shifted to the right. But I hope it hasn't shifted past November of 2021 so far to the right. I think just the recent duration and frequency of rain events have reiterated just how vulnerable our community is to just rainfall events. And uh, I hope that that stays high on our agenda, that we find ourselves in a position and having done the homework and engaged the community so that we can have, uh, there isn't a better time to be borrowing money. Our last borrowed money was only 1% above the 10-year treasury note, roughly 
I think a lot of our cost estimates were based around four and a half when I went back and looked at our material from earlier this year. And, 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 and we need to be very aggressive, and I want to hopefully we can come back and have this debate. I've been talking with industry. I do believe that we can move more aggressively if we have a different delivery model. And I, and I want to have engagement on that because I think that people, just as much as they're talking about the resort area, they're also hearing from us, we are not moving fast enough and we are not doing enough to mitigate the threat that, fund, that flooding and the inconvenience that it creates. And, and we just need to have a more aggressive approach that takes money, that'll take a tax increase. And I've talked all about those things, but I do believe that's preferred to be in Houston and having to recover from a devastating flood, and then they had a $2 billion bond referendum. So, Mr. Mayor, I hope we can make sure that as we go into October, look at our retreat, look at our legislative package and our CIP, that we predicate it on a successful bond referendum in November, and we can show the projects and what that would deliver to our community. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, be assured, in spite of our challenges, it still remains a high priority. And uh, economic development is also actively trying to bring in new business and new revenue streams. So, you know, I think it's got to be, uh, you know, multifaceted approach, but I certainly thank you for bringing it up. Any other council comments? Okay. Ms. Wilson. Um, many of you know that I sit on the State Broadband Advisory Council. And we uh, had a meeting a few days ago, and the governor is, gonna, is giving $85 million to, from the CARES Act fund to go into broadband, and this will go statewide, but most of it is going to be benefiting schools and creating hotspots and helping those uh, students who do not have the right equipment to be doing their distance learning. So hopefully we'll be getting part of that, but it was, it was really good news to see that 85 million. And also our very own Deborah Bryan is on the working committee for the state as well. So she's in there and they're really, she told me they're coming up with some very good and innovative ideas. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, at this point, Mr. Vice Mayor, can we do the uh, account, um, agenda review? Okay, under ordinances and resolutions, does anybody want to pull anything off the consent? We have more speakers. Everybody okay with that, John? I have uh, two comments. One, I'll be, I would like to read at the end my abstention letter from the Commonwealth Attorney with regards to item H7. Okay, so I'm, H7 you're abstaining on? Correct, and I do have outstanding questions, but they're not prejudiced to my affirmative vote on H2 and H3, but I do expect Mr. City Manager to get the answers to my questions and the requested information for my education, but, and that also dealt with item four as well. Thank you. Okay, anybody else have problems with anything under ordinances or resolutions? Okay, um, Mr. Moss, I didn't know if you wanted to make the motion later on for this, or you pass that down there. That's the thing we talked about in executive. Yes, I'd be happy to okay. do so. So we'll, we'll bring that up at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, Mr. Stiles, that would be, he would bring up that, that ordinance at what point? The, uh, the, the motion to add the item would come um, um, any time before you consider the consent agenda for ordinances and resolutions. Okay, got it. All right, under planning, um, Items five and six in the Bayside District, Mr. Jones is pulling uh, to, for, to hear. Item I-1, City of Virginia Beach, special exception for alternative compliance to the form-based code, Ray recurring outdoor assembly use and open air market special events for properties located south of Interstate 264 west of Parks Avenue and slightly east of Parks Avenue north of 18th Street west of Washington Avenue north of 17th Street in the Beach District. Mr. Tower. I'm sorry, Mr. Wood, I'm trying to find where you are. Item I-1. I, I got H. Is this under the planning? Yes, sir. I'm still not saying it. Okay. Mr. Mayor, if I might. Yes. Um, because we are having a joint 
meeting with the planning commission and because of that joint meeting we have not received any we're going to need to receive you you the body the council is going to re need to receive new recommendations from the planning commission on these items my recommendation is that you defer your consideration of consent agenda until the planning commission is here with you and they have told you what they're putting on their consent agenda and what their recommendations are. If you know that, uh, for example, in items five and six, where a council member has requested that they be pulled, then I think those are pulled from the consent agenda for both bodies. But likewise, if they pull something from their consent agenda, you'll need to hear that as well. Okay. So uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. Does anybody want to pull anything other than items five and six? Well, on I-1, there is nothing in, the, uh, in our book about I-1. It looks like there was a place hold for it, but my book doesn't have anything on it. Other, I do see it here. I'm sorry I didn't raise that earlier, but uh, I, I'm just unable to comment on it because I don't know what it is. Okay. Well, at this point, should we go ahead and just... Uh, Hold on and wait till the planning commission gets here, and you know uh, they're going to be doing their body of business first initially, and then we can you know can figure out our consent agenda based on uh, what they do. Is that correct, Mr. Attorney? Our recommendation is that when after you've done your ordinances and resolutions, and the planning commission is here, uh, the the clerk will advise both bodies of any items for which there are uh, speakers other than the applicant. And at that time, obviously, if there are speakers other than the applicant or more than one speaker other than the applicant, then those items would automatically be pulled. But at that time, uh, the Planning Commission could tell you, membership could tell you whether there are items that they want to pull and you would likewise at that point indicate whether there are items that you wanted to pull and any items that either body pulled would have to be heard independently after both consent agenda were considered. So the, the Planning Commission presumably will have a uh, consent agenda, then the council will have, a, a, will, will, will take up those items on the, its consent agenda and then you will go to all of the items one by one that are not on the consent agenda. Okay. So it's okay at this point just to... We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll, we'll get it figured out on the uh, planning items later. Okay, and so that would be it right now. Mr. And if it's Mr. okay... Mayor, can I have my nickel back, please? Pardon? If I cut my nickel back. I yes. just wanted to share with council. I did ask the finance department and the city attorney's office to look into the... Po is it possible for us to use a portion of our second round of uh, CARE Act funding to actually supplement unemployment insurance since it's unlikely that the 600, any portion of the $600 will be continued. And as much as uh, we are doing for our own employees, many of our citizens who are unemployed due to COVID, the state unemployment of $385 a week doesn't go very far. So I just want to let you know that I have asked to see whether or not and under what conditions that would be an eligible reimbursable expense for the second round of our CARE Act funding. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moss. Okay, at this point, why don't we take a uh, break until we reconvene for the formal session at uh, six o'clock.